Back with us is David Bonson, CIO over at the Bonson Group. He joins us here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. What do you make of this relentless move higher? Well, I think a lot of things are getting quite stretched, and that valuation story has uh, has kind of confounded things all year long. Uh, you have expensive things getting more expensive. You do not have organic earnings growth. They already priced in really robust earnings growth, and it's lived up to it, but it's not going above and beyond that, yet valuations are expanding. So if you're getting new money right now, how are you putting it to work if things are expensive? So we're not index investors and we're not big tech investors. And so within a dividend growth, very concentrated portfolio, we never own more than about 30 companies at a time. We think there's good pockets of value in some of consumer staples. We've had a very good year in both financials and even energy. Energy as a sector hasn't done well, but midstream has done quite well and is still really well valued. Uh, but we also are going in slowly. We're tethering. If we're getting brand new cash in, we're not putting every dollar of it to work on day one. How much new cash are you bringing in? Uh, how much new cash are we bringing in in terms of just new monies that come in? Yeah. Um, well, we bring in anywhere from 50 to $100 million a month of new money every month. Is that pretty regular? I'm just yeah. curious if it's different from what you've seen over the last six months or so. Um, it's been very consistent for us for a few years now. A bad month is 50, a good month is uh, 120. And uh, right now we're, we're kind of tethering it in. And, and again, some of the more undervalued things, if we get a company that has disappointing earnings, it gives us a chance to add more. So what you guys are calling the losers of the decline, Miners, yeah, you know, yeah. That's what we like. We like those things when they take a check back. Where's the new money coming from? Uh, well, look, there's still a lot of M&A activity. We've had a lot of clients that have sold businesses. You have a lot of people that uh, have had bonds and different things mature. Uh, the, the one thesis I don't agree with is this money market balance and all this cash on the yeah, side. more than coming. $6 trillion. I, in I don't think that money's right coming now. back into equities. Where do you think it's going to go? Bonds. I think most of it was either reserve savings money that was previously zero interest deposit that went to money market to get a little oh. yield, or it came out of the bond market where you could get rid of duration risk and get the same uh, yield. I wonder why that number keeps getting higher. Um, I think a lot of it is because people are confusing bank deposit and money market, that you had a lot of money market, which is really short-term T-bills, commercial paper, and it just became a surrogate for bonds because after 2022, which 23 is when bulk of this money moved, yeah. and you had uh, the risk at Silicon Valley Bank and some of those things, money markets are paying five, five and a half percent yields. People said, well, bonds are down 10%, 15%. Why do I need to go into bonds? I can go to money market and get a higher yield. So it just kind of reallocated a lot of that positioning. Um, in terms of Treasury, and you look at the U.S. yield curve, I mean, do you think that we could once again test 5% here, potentially on the 10%? Um, I mean, I, on the 10-year, 10, 10 I do not, no. I mean, obviously you could, but it would not be our thesis. I think that, look, there's been very little move up in tip spreads at all. It's been entirely real GDP expectations. So the real growth expectations are not good enough to get the 10-year up to 5%. If it did, I wouldn't see it as a negative because it's not coming from higher inflation expectations. It's coming from higher real growth expectations. And I think that it's gotten quite stretched here. We were at four, 370. It's gotten up to the 425, 430. Uh, I would be very surprised if it goes much above 450, but that's because I'm long-term bearish on structural growth. The 10-year does not measure the Fed. Every day I'm hearing someone say, why if the Fed's cutting is the 10-year going higher? The Fed can't control the long end of the curve. No, it's the shorter end of the yield It's curve. the short end is all they can control. The 10-year really does price in trillions of dollars of real people's expectations for nominal GDP growth. Inflation isn't moving. Real growth has moved up a bit. But doesn't the longer end of the yield curve potentially also um, factor in what the U.S. government does in terms of debt on their balance sheet? And that is something that, once again, for those of us who have been around a long time, we remember all those arguments and concerns about the deficit, and then it went away. And now it's back again. And this is where I'm a, a contrarian uh, from the lessons of Japan and the lessons of the U.S. for 15 years after our own financial crisis. I do not believe that growing deficits pushes the yields higher, puts downward pressure on yields mm. because it suppresses growth. And so Japan went to 250% debt to GDP and ended up with negative yields forever. Central banks then manipulate and intervene at that stage. But the point being that real growth expectations go lower, not higher, from increased deficit spending. We're far past the point of a multiplier on this fiscal stimulus. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, a comment from Ed Yardani a little earlier today on, on Bloomberg TV. He talked about uh, bond vigilantes mustering as the U.S. and the U.K. prep debt sales. Um, are you concerned about a potential return of bond vigilantes? 
No, I'm kind of amused that we're talking about 30 or 40 basis points. So that's supposed to be bond vigilantes. The 10 years come all the way up to 4.3%, which is still 70, 75 basis points less than it was a year ago. Um, there's no bond vigilantes. Now, Ed, to his defense, who's a brilliant guy and a friend, He's talking about the potential for it to happen. Mm -hmm. But again, the bond vigilante thesis has been out there since post-financial crisis. We've run up these deficits, and it has done nothing but put downward pressure on bond yields. That said, this election, what happens if one of these parties sweeps and they get this blank check to spend? I'll either both can't, I don't care who you're talking about. They're both talking about spending a lot of money. Neither candidate is going to have a blank check to spend what they want. Even, uh, first of all, I think it's very unlikely that Harris ends up with a Democrat House and Senate. It would be a real miracle for her to win and that the Senate move in that direction. But let's say she has a 50-50 uh, control. Mm -hmm. There's one or two Democrats that won't approve a lot of the spending as well. Um, in, in Trump's case, a lot of the projections for deficit blowouts have to do more with the lost revenue side uh, than increased spending. I still think he'll spend a lot. I don't think he minds spending spending or big debt and deficits, but the red side of the Senate and House, I think, will have to hold them in. They won't, to the degree I need us to. All we're debating is whether or not the deficit goes up a trillion or a trillion and a half. But the biggest thing that's going to bring deficits down a few hundred billion is rates coming lower. The, the term structure of Treasury debt is so loaded to the short end of the curve that if you go from a 5% T-bill to a 2 or 3% T-bill, you're pulling out hundreds of billions of dollars of debt service mm -hmm. cost. That's going to be some of the relief there. What do you make of a lost decade in stocks? You know that this has been something we've been, everybody's been kicking around. David Costin of Goldman Sachs, chief U.S. equity strategist, published a um, paper. Uh, and basically what he said is um, suggesting the index, S&P 500, will gain only 3% in nominal terms, 1% in real terms per year over the next decade, which would be one of the worst on record. Um, you buy that? Completely, but I feel like he plagiarized it for me, but I'm joking, David Costin is brilliant. <laughs> His name almost rhymes with David Bonson, and I've been saying this for several years. I believe the post-crisis bull market <laughs> ended in November 2021, and we started at that point a period of what effectively could be a lost decade. I think he said 3% uh, real growth, and I, I could see it four or five. 3% three, three nominal, 1% real. Right, that will feel like a lost decade to most people, even if you get, let's say, 3% real, 5% nominal. Even then, you're talking about a tiny fraction of what investors got used to. Investors aren't even right now prepared for historical returns, 9 or 10 in the S&P. They're used to 14 or 15, and they're used to 14 or 15 without right. down years along the way. Well, some would say that about rates. This is, you know, historically more normal than but, what we've but seen But you just the last cannot get so. the earnings growth, and you certainly can't get the, ex the multiple expansion to make that possible. All right, David Bonson, thank you so much. CIO of the Bonson Group joining us right here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio.